Uh, that being said, I want you to do me a favor and let's, uh, let's grab a copy of God's Word. And uh, don't, don't slight yourself, grab a copy of it, and please turn to uh, Luke chapter 17. And Luke chapter 17, uh, our feast tonight is going to be verses 11 through 19. So go ahead and turn there, please, uh, and don't shortchange yourself. Grab those notebooks, grab those pens. Let's, let's show Jesus we mean business, we want to learn, we want to grow, uh, we are going through the Gospel of Luke, of course, uh, to be informed, uh, because informed worshipers are better worshipers. And so we're going through Luke to find out who Jesus is and what he taught and what he actually did. We want to be informed so that we could make a decision on this. Who is this Jesus? There's all kinds of things we can do, but we've got to get that thing done. We've got to get that thing uh, figured out beforehand. Who he is, we want to be informed. And then, of course, the, the whole reason for being informed is to take that which uh, goes into our mind and, and let it uh, conform us. That's the whole purpose here. We're to be informed so that we can be conformed, uh, Romans 8, 29 would say, into the image of Jesus Christ. That's God's plan for each and every person that's ever been born. I believe it's in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 where it says that it is God's desire that all are saved and to understand the truth. And so our information should turn into conformation and we should be changed into the image of Jesus Christ the Son. We learned this last week, uh, Ephesians 5.1, it says that we're to imitate God in everything that we do. Well, how would we do that? How would we imitate God? God is, is, is an unseen sovereign in, in heaven, sitting on a throne, and how would we know? Well, one of the reasons why Jesus Christ came is so that we would know. And so, so Jesus Christ, uh, everything you need to know about imitating God is found in Christ. So Ephesians 5.1 says imitate God. Ephesians 5.2 tells us to imitate Jesus, that Jesus is the one to be imitated. And so that's what we're uh, in the process of doing. We want to be informed and then conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So that being said, let's pick up here in Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. You guys ready? Okay, he's got your attention. Not on Facebook or nothing, right? All right. Here's what it says. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked up at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when they saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God! He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go, your faith has healed you. Amen. Okay. So, so here's the first thing I want you to, 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 to jot down if you're a note taker, I hope that you are, is that Jesus Christ, if we're going to be informed and conformed, Jesus Christ is extremely intentional in all that he does. He's extremely focused. Nothing changes Jesus Christ's focus. This is my plan. It's not open for discussion. It's not subject to change. That's who Jesus Christ is. And see, we're so not like that. So we change our jobs constantly. We change our majors. You ever, you ever go to college and you change your major 467 times, drive your parents crazy before you fig, kind of figure out and find yourself? We change spouses. We change houses. We change cities. We change churches. That's us. Our, the circumstances of our life and the situations that we find ourselves in, let's be honest, right? They, 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 they say something to us. They change the way we think, and they change what we do. The culture that we're in 
and the circumstances and all of our situations, whatever comes into your life, it, it, it impacts us and it leads us to believe that it's somehow better over there, right? I mean, it, isn't that what culture teaches us? No, aren't we taught that we should be open to change? That change is good? And in some cases, change is good. But not all the time. You can't just make a blanket statement. Change is good. Change is good. No, no not necessarily. It's not always good. It's not always good. You see, that's not how Jesus lived. And we're trying to be informed about who he is so we can be conformed into that, right? And Jesus didn't live this way. He didn't constantly change what he was doing and who he was. And see, God's word teaches us something very, very different than who we are and what we practice. Right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 14. You can jot that reference down. I hope you will, and I hope that you'll read it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But to paraphrase what it says, it says basically this, that I, as the teacher, should be teaching you something. And you, as the student, should be learning something. And it goes on to tell us that we should be learning about God's son, Jesus. And then it says why. So we can be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So let's dive into that a little bit, but I, I just wanted to say this. Nowhere in there is the bar so lowered that it says that he just wants you to kind of be a little bit like Jesus, but still remain a lot like Scott. Now, it doesn't say that. It says here that he wants you to be mature in the Lord, full and and complete full and complete so so what is this this full and complete standard that we're to measure up to what is this growth that god speaks of and intends for you well i'd say that a lot of that at least in in this text is wrapped up in this simple statement right here as you began the reading it said this as jesus continued on toward jerusalem that is a humongous statement. All throughout the New Testament, you hear Jesus talk about his time. You know, my, my time has not yet arrived, or he would reference it as, as my hour has not yet come. You know, there was, this, there was this thing that was going to happen. Reference way, way back, 800 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah in 53.10 of his book said that it was God's good plan to crush Jesus for our sin. Something was going to happen that was planned. And that's what Jesus is referencing. That, that that thing that was planned by God, it was gonna happen. And much like us today trying to predict when Jesus will come back, there was a plan for this to happen. And no one on earth really knew exactly the day that it was gonna happen. There was a time that had been chosen. When was this time? Well, 1 Peter 1.20 gives us some clarity. It says that Jesus Christ was chosen to be slain for our sin before the earth was created. Before anything was. Before there was a single human being on earth, there was one. And with this one, part of this one was Jesus Christ. Back, back, way back in eternity past was God by himself, nothing existed. There was no earth. There was no sun. There was no stars. There was no water. There was no mountains. There was nothing except him. And Jesus was there. And there was a plan that this was going to happen before anyone had come. And I don't, I can't tell you when that was supposed to be, you know. No one knew when that was going to happen. But God knew. And Jesus knew that he had an appointment. He had a purpose. Jesus knew God's plan for his life here as a man. And even so, even though the, the situation was grim, it was super, super bad, right? It wasn't going to be fun. There's nothing to look forward to this crucifixion, this hour, this time. Pain was assured. Mockery and disgrace were guaranteed. But it didn't change anything. And that's why I would say in Luke 9, 51, it says that as that day, as that time, from way, way back, before anything was, there was a time that this thing was going to happen, that he was going to be slain for your sin, and he was going to have to endure the, the amazing pain that we could never describe in words, of, of not only taking on all of our sin and the punishment of it, but having his father, who he loves perfectly, look away from him. 
And that day was coming. But even though all of that was coming, and in his flesh, certainly he didn't want to deal with that. Who would? But in 951 of, of Luke, it says that as this day and all that it had in store approached, Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. Some translations would say that he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So he didn't like meander around. Whatever comes my way, I'll just kind of respond like a pinball machine. No, no, no. He made a decision from way back when. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm paying for your sin, and nothing's going to stop me. That was Jesus Christ, the Lord. And so to be you know, mature in the Lord and to measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ, what does this mean? Well, it means that we're to be like Jesus. We're supposed to be like that, but we're not like that. And earlier I mentioned some of the things that we're super prone to, changing cities. Oh, this job sounds better. I'll go over there. And that house looks better. I'll go over there. And, and that woman looks nicer. And, and that guy looks better. And, and, and back and forth. And oh, I like this preacher better. And I like that band better. And that's a better this and this. And we just change all the time. And Jesus is like, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Verse 14 of, of, of Ephesians 4, after it talks about being mature in the Lord and full and complete, it says to not be like immature children tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. Like every single thing that comes into your life, you don't have to take the bait. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a thing that God wants for you. Find it and do it and stop being so distracted and running all over the place, always changing everything. Jesus knew this is what my life is about. And this is what I'm doing. And nothing's going to change it ever. Amen. That's Jesus Christ. And that's the way we're supposed to be. Your circumstances of life and your feelings. And, and, and we got this storm now, right? So fears. Everyone's, a, everyone's so afraid. Nope. Why? Why, why are we so afraid? We all have difference of opinion. I'm just going to give you mine. Every week we come to church. and We stand up here and talk to you about Jesus. I want you to be saved. I want you to love him. Why? So we can be in glory together forever, right? That's what we all want. And as soon as the opportunity comes to go be in glory, we run from it. Why are you so scared? My, listen, let me, tell you, let me tell you a little evan evangelistic tool. This is not part of the message, but it's, it's good. So my sister and my mom and my father, they're not Christians. They don't, they don't believe in Jesus. They don't like Jesus. They hate Jesus. And they've been calling me and texting me. My sister can't sleep because she's so afraid for us. And, and, and my father, Jesus loves my father. Somebody's got to love everybody. Pray for your preacher. Whew. Hey. That's all good. Detention. <laughs> So, so, and, and my, my father's the same way, like he's like texting me all these things that I should do to protect the kids and just insulting me because I'm terrible and I don't know what I'm doing and what, are you just going to live on your faith? Is that what you, you know, he just pokes fun and I'm like, yeah, of course. So the point is this, not to rip old Harvey, it's, it's, to, it's to say this, that because of this storm and any other crazy thing that'll come into your life, this is an opportunity to show the lost world the superior life that we have in faith. Like when, we're, when everyone else that doesn't have Jesus is scared to death because I might drown, I might, my house might burn down, my car might float away, my, I might die. Praise God, right? Whatever. What, right? I mean, it doesn't make any difference, right? Because so, so, God, see, here's the thing. God, in his word, which is always true, and always comes to pass. 
And that's a great place for an amen. amen. Right? Amen. He said he already knows what you need. And if we would just seek him first, he'd give you everything that you need. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Is that waived because of Hurricane Irma? No. Guess who's in charge of Hurricane Irma? The same God who made the promise. So what do you got to worry about? He, he, didn't, he, didn't wave, he didn't wave his promise like there's no little asterisk down there that says, you know, I promise to do this as long as it's nice out. The, the end times are coming. We've got to stock up on everything. Why? Is he not going to provide anymore? Does his provision end when he cuts open the clouds? Nope, nope. Well, why are we so afraid? Everyone else is afraid. And you're not. And you need to show the world what it means to live with faith. Amen. To have a God that you can trust. Okay? Hallelujah. So let's not be afraid ever. So, so, so there's circumstances and there's feelings and there's fear and, and pain that, that change what we do. And listen, the, how about, when talk about pain, how about the, the, the desire to avoid pain? So we make decisions because we don't want, we know what's coming and we don't want to deal with it, so we make decisions to dodge the pain. When all the while, the pain, how many people in their greatest trial and pain has driven them to their knees right to Jesus? Raise your hand. So why are we avoiding pain? Amen. Why? Nobody wants pain. We pray it away all the time. Dumb. Yeah. Oftentimes, God uses that pain to teach us something, right? And so we want to we want to embrace what's going on and instead of praying it away ask for some wisdom. You know it says if you lack wisdom ask your father he'll tell you. So don't don't just say God take this away. Say God t teach me something, right? So 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 listen, none of these things no circumstance in Jesus' life, no matter how he felt in his flesh, no matter how much he, I, I don't want to attribute fear to him, I don't think he had any, but in his flesh, maybe he had a little bit, he knew he was going to the cross, that's, that's supposed to hurt, right? He's got pain that he knows is inevitable, he's going to be mocked, he's going to be spit on, he's going to be stabbed and spiked and killed and whipped and beaten, and, then, and, and cultural expectation, people were telling him, like, do this and don't do that, he's like, no, 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 nothing stops me from pursuing my purpose. That's Jesus Christ, right? And, and so to measure up to his full and complete standard means that you should be and do the same. Like you should accomplish your purpose. Well, what is the purpose? What is, what is my purpose? I can't accomplish something if I don't know what it is. Well, there's a little uh, verse in Scripture. It's my favorite one, just a few words, and it's, it's, it's kind of like a microcosm of the big purpose. And it's uh, Colossians 1.16 says that everything was created for him. That's your purpose. So if you were wondering the greatest things in life, what, what, what am I here for, God? Why do I exist? What am I to do? Right there. Colossians 1.16. You were created for him. What does that mean? So, so I, and listen, I don't have to come up with anything creative because I'm not. We go back to God's word to find out our purpose. So I would just say that to, to expand on Colossians 1.16, which says that you're created for him, how, how, how about this? Um, my purpose on this earth is to love God with all my mind, heart, soul, and strength. Like, that, that, that's your, that's your that, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what you do 24 hours a day, but that's the purpose for your existence. That's why you live, right? Is, is to love him with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And then the, if, if you've read the Bible, you know that that's the great commandment. So it's like, of all the things that you want me to do, Lord, what, what's the one thing that's, that's over and above all other things that you want of my life? I want you to love me with everything that you are. Every shred of your being, I want you to love me. That's your purpose, Amen. right? And, 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 and in our country, and I'm guilty of it too, that we're, we're, we are, we are task-oriented, so my purpose, I need to accomplish something. Something has to have closure to feel like I accomplished it. Are you tracking with me? But that's not God's thing. There's no closure to that. That's an, listen, as you grow, mature in the Lord, maturing is a process, and so as time goes on, you love him more. 
And, and you give him more of your strength and you give him more of your heart and you give him more of your soul and you give him more of your thoughts and more of your resources. You're not backing down as you get older. It should be increasing. Love him more. That's the purpose for your existence. Now, if you know the great commandment, you know there's a second part to that. Where it talks about loving the Lord with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. I can't help but believe that the second part of this is just a way to, to show how you do that. What's the, what's the way you would do this? What's the greatest thing you could do for God? Is to, is to accomplish his purposes, right? Not your own. For him, right? A, a king's glory is a growing population. So, so our purpose would be to love the Lord with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. And then to love other people. How would we do that? What's the greatest What's the greatest gift you could give somebody? Jesus Christ, right? You, I, listen, we, we got the hurricane coming, and, and people are going to, all over the state of Florida, and, and who knows, maybe Louisiana, all that stuff, and they got them in Texas. We could bring them food, and you could bring them clothes, and you could, you could do all this stuff and, and rebuild their homes, and we should. Christians should do that. But above and beyond all of that, the greatest way you could love them is to give them the one thing that would save their soul for eternity. It's Jesus Christ. So our purpose is just this, to love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and to tell everybody about his great son, Jesus. That's the reason you live. That's the purpose for your existence. And so now's the challenging part. If you were to look at your schedule. And if you were to look at your resources, would you say that you're fulfilling that purpose? Not, not, and it's not to look at, you know, it's not Kim to look at Carl and say, well, he's not, or, you know, vice versa. No, it's yourself, right? It, it's me, like, it, it, this is no joke. Like, let's not trample upon the blood of the covenant. Let's, let's take this seriously. The, the, the purpose of you drawing breath is to love and serve the Lord, right? So, so what does your life look like? Can you say with any level of sincerity that that is what you're living? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't even know I'm searching for an answer here. It's a, it's a time to look inward. It's a time to look in and say, okay, if this is the purpose of my life, I've got this much time, I've got this much money, I've got this much that I'm stewarding, am I using this to fulfill this purpose or am I tucking them into the nooks and crannies of my life? See, my purpose is to love God with all my mind, heart, soul, and strength and to tell everybody about his great son, Jesus Christ. And situations don't slow this purpose. Circumstances and culture do not alter this plan. I have set my face like stone, Isaiah said, determined to do his will. Is that you? No. Have, have you any convictions or commitments? It's, it's, to, it's time to look inward. You know, the scriptures say, search my heart, O God. Like, it's not to look at anyone else. When, when, when David said that, he was talking to God about, hey, go kill my enemies, because they're doing this and they're doing that. He was throwing that blame out there, but then the next statement is, but search my heart. So there's a time when you have to look inward. I mean, do you have any convictions? Do you have any commitments that need to be kept I'm not talk, I'm talking bedrock stuff. I'm not talking about a, a new hobby or, or, or stuff like that. But look at your schedule and, and look, at, look at your gravestone. What's written on it? Would, 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 would on your gravestone, and it looks like I'm preaching to myself, I, I prepared this message early this week in... in preparation for the hurricane and so instead of preparing it and working on it to get ready for this I was done on Tuesday so I had a lot of time for that to work on me so I started thinking about my gravestone which is no fun but I was thinking about my gravestone what's it going to say on my gravestone would it say that Moses Robbins accomplished God's purposes in his life I uh, yeah. And, and so that's for you. Do you, do you, we're talking about 
be conformed into the image of Jesus. And there's a lot of ways we can be like Jesus, but in this context, we're talking about a person who's resolute. I've set my face towards Jerusalem, and I know it's going to hurt, and I know I'm not going to like it, but this is the purpose that I've been called to, and I'm going to do it. I have a conviction. I have a, a, a commitment Jesus had, didn't he? And he was going to fulfill it, and so do we have any commitments or convictions? We're to be like Jesus. We're to keep them. So that's the first thing. So here's the second thing about Jesus. Jesus is, is intentional. He's not going to stop. He did what he was supposed to do. Nothing distracted him. Super focused, right? Here's the second thing. Jesus is a universal savior. Now before you go chucking tomatoes at me. I'm not saying that he or I is a universalist. I'm not a Unitarian. I'm not a universalist, a Unitarian universalist. Uh, those are folks that believe that everybody gets in. That, that, that no matter who you are and no matter what you've done and no matter who you want to call God and, and it could be Buddha and it could be Scientology and it could be the spaghetti monster and it could be Jesus and it could be Allah and Muhammad and all these different things that it doesn't make any difference what you believe. You, you know what? You could, you could even not believe anything. That even if you're an atheist, it wouldn't matter. Because the universalist will say that God's love is so passionate for his creation that it'll cut through any problem and you'll get saved. Well, that sounds nice, right? Sounds nice. Well, this God is so, so kind and loves us so much. That's, that sounds great. It's just not true. It's just not true. See, see, when I say Jesus is a universal savior, I don't mean that he's a universalist where everybody gets in. No, Jesus says anybody is welcome in, but I'm the way, and no one gets in except through me. So it's not that he's super mean. You know, the universalist thinks, oh, that sounds nice. God loves us all. We can do whatever we want. He'll, he'll take us into glory. Great, 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 great. Awesome, awesome. It's just not the way it is. But what's awesome is that Jesus says, yeah, everybody can get in, but it's this way. It's through me only. That's it. <clears throat> the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, I say this, that, that he's a universal savior because, well, let's be honest, we tend to... to to choose our invites to the faith and to our church pretty carefully. And, and I'm sure not everyone's going to raise their hand and admit their shortcoming in this one. I, I will. We, we, we tend to extend our invites carefully. What I mean by that is, is everybody has uh, a list. You all have a list. You should just show me your list. You should pull your list out because you have it. And that list is, is, is your list of sins. So there's, there's certain sins that, that, are, that are acceptable. And, and, and we don't mind inviting someone to our faith or to our church for, for a certain sin because, uh, you know, uh, culturally accepted. Uh, maybe it's a sin that you're guilty of. Well, of course, if I'm guilty of it, then I can't hold it against this person. So if I'm doing this, then, then you can come to my church because you do that and I do it, so it's all good. And so we have this list of, and we, we, we put them in order Right? Like the things that we are offended on the most are up here. And I don't know which one that is. That might be something that, you know, it, it, maybe, it's, it, maybe to you it's, it's murder. Like that's the, that's the worst sin. Like I, 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 I don't mind if someone's greedy. They can come to church. But if they're a murderer, I don't want them in here. Maybe it's murder. Maybe it's something inappropriate with children. Maybe it's, it, maybe it's thievery. Maybe it's, you know, my sister, she, if, if her husband cheated on her, I think she'd get past it. But if he lies to her, she goes crazy. That's her thing. She's got a, she's got a sin that's, that's the, 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 the great sin of, of every, like that's it. The unpardonable one. That's her unpardonable sin. And so we have this list of, you know, some of them are kind of acceptable sins, and some of them are like at arm's length. Like, yeah, I understand Jesus saved me. I go here, but that doesn't mean I'll invite you there. 
you know, and, and let's just be honest, it got really quiet in the room because it's true. The question is, is, is Jesus like that? The reason why I want to know if Jesus is like that because I'm trying to figure out who he is and who I should be. So let's just see about that. Look at verse 12. Continues on to Jerusalem. Did anyone turn the, the, the air conditioning up over 72? Because I'm dying. Did someone turn it up? I'm going to stone you. Holy hot dogs, Batman. My goodness gracious. It got quiet in here just now, too. Someone did it. I'm going to watch all of you, see who's, who's smiling. <laughs> okay, verse 12. He's a universal savior. Look at it says. Uh, he continues on to Jerusalem. He reaches the border between Galilee and Samaria as he entered a village there. That's it. That's it. That's all you want that's all I want you to see. As he entered a village there. Um life is just um a series of choices, isn't it? It, it, we just, we're faced with, you know, all these things I said earlier, circumstances, situations, where we're faced with a choice. Every single day, probably hundreds of them every single day. We, we just have to make some choices. And, and, and there was, that's no different for Jesus Christ. He, he, he had to make some choices. Um, he's, he's, it says he entered the village. Well, did he have to do that? If you, if you go to the border of Samaria and Galilee... It, it has a certain look. Danielle, could you bring that up for me, please? No. That does, definitely doesn't look like that. I don't even know where that came from. Wow. Desert. No desert. Awesome. So, <laughs> pretty flat. Some hills. No big trees just sand, right? That's what you'd see. Galilee is northern Israel. I use this pole over here for Israel all the time when I'm describing it because it's kind of shaped like that Israel, right? Kind of tall and narrow. And so up top here is this little Sea of Galilee where Jesus did much of his ministry. And as he's going from the Sea of Galilee down to Jerusalem, he has to cut through this area called Samaria. And so does he... Samaria, <laughs> Samaria is, is, yeah, there you go. Samaria is, is, is an area where the Jewish folks uh, didn't go. Uh, the people who lived there, the Jewish folks didn't like them. The reason why is because they were, they were, um, they were marrying, they were, they were marrying into other cultures. And, and, and God was quite clear from the beginning, like, don't marry other religions, if you will, because if you do, they will suck you into their idol worship. So, so don't do this. But these people did. And so there was a little bit of, of strife between the, those Jewish people that didn't do that versus them that did. And so these, that's where they live. Now, it also says that, that there were lepers there. Okay, so, so lepers, just so you know, right, they didn't have me medicine like they have now, where if someone has an issue, they can go get fixed pretty easily, antibiotics, whatever. Most likely, they're going to get cured. Well, lepers, they'd have their skin would be falling off. You guys all know about this, right? Just disgusting. It's all oozing and falling, their skin's falling up nasty, right? And so in the Jewish faith, if you were a leper, you were an outcast. Religiously, you couldn't go to the temple. You couldn't come in here and worship. And you could, and, you, and socially, like, you were an outcast there too. They made you live outside of the city gates. And if anyone was coming near you, the responsibility legally for the leper was to cover themselves up and yell, unclean, unclean, so that none of the clean folks would get anywhere near this person. They were a complete outcast. And, and, and that is the village that Jesus is walking through the desert and he comes upon it. So does he, does he have to go into the village? Well, yes, no, I don't know. Think about this for a second. Put yourself in Jesus' shoes. You're in the sermon now. You're walking across 
the desert like that, and you've got some people, a group of people following you, and, and, and here, imagine horizon to horizon, right? It, it, just imagine it now. You're out there, it's pretty wide open, just like that. And you can see peripheral here all the way across to here. You're with a group of people. You're on your way to Jerusalem. And here's this, it says there's this village. It didn't say that there was a city. It takes 20 minutes to, in a car to get from one end of Leesburg to another. And this is not a big city. But it doesn't say city. It doesn't say town. It says village. So put village in perspective of this horizon that you're walking into. And there's Jesus. And it's not like today when you're driving down the highway going 70 or 80 miles an hour in the left lane and all of a sudden you realize, oh, that's my exit in a quarter of a mile. You start booking it over here. You gotta make a decision real quick because you don't know if you're gonna miss the exit. I gotta go, I gotta go, right? You start blowing people off and you go through and you cut them off and it's not like that. He's walking horizon to horizon, full horizon. And in the middle of this horizon is a village. Does he need to go in there? He's a Jewish rabbi. He's with people who are following him. His flesh and his free will give him the opportunity to say, no, I don't have to go through there. Right? That's, there's lepers there. There's Samaritans there. We're Jewish. I don't need to go there. I, could, I don't need to make a last-ditch effort to get off the, the interstate because this is my exit. No, no, no. I'm walking just like this. And it's way off. Did you ever go through Texas on Highway 10? You do that every other day. <laughs> so you can see five miles ahead of you, ten miles ahead of you for, the, for an hour, right? whatever it is. Forever. You can see a truck on the horizon. It takes an hour before they pass you. So here's Jesus doing that, walking. Did he have to go in there? Well, I would say his flesh and his free will as a man would say, no, he didn't have to, but his purpose and plan says, oh yes, I have to go in there, right? I have to. You know, I listened to some teaching just the other day in preparation for this, didn't see it coming, but there it was. And, and it, it reminded me that I have to extend the gospel to everybody. No matter what their history, right? No matter what their history, no matter what their sin, no matter where that sin that they are guilty of falls on your list or my list, I have to extend the gospel. It doesn't matter about their history, their sin, their ethnicity, their age, their sex. This is a big one. Their political affiliation. Because every Christian is a gun-slinging Republican, right? No. Not at all. And we have to extend the gospel to everyone, no matter their religious beliefs or lack thereof. Let me tell you why. In the Bible, in the book of Revelation, when it all comes to an end, when it's all it, in heaven, in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, it says that there will be, it'll be filled with a bunch of Christians from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every language. So if, if heaven has diversity in it, if, if, if heaven will be filled with people that are completely not like you in ways that our culture would separate us, age, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, political affiliation, north, south, young, old, man, woman, whatever it is, if heaven is filled with all those things, then therefore in our lives now as Christ's kingdom here on earth, the scriptures say in the Colossians 3.11, in this new life, that doesn't mean in the life to come, does it? In this new, in this new life, if you've bent the knee to Jesus and his spirit lives in you, you're a new creation, the Bible says. So he says in this life, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or not, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. He's like, listen, and this is just a short list. The point is this, it doesn't make any difference 
who they are, what they've done, what they look like, any doesn't make it all these things that we call different in heaven in God's kingdom. There's he, you know that Jesus was the one who came up with with uh, common core. He did. Because all the other stuff means nothing. At the core of heaven, we have something in common. Jesus is in us all. That's it. It doesn't make any difference what you look like. It doesn't make any difference your color, your age, whatever. In heaven, there's one thing we all have in common. Christ is in us all. And so in this life here, that's all that should matter too. We should forsake the things that culture uses to separate us and just come around this one common thing. If you are purple and you're a murderer and you've done this and that or you're a stone-cold atheist, whatever it is, give them the gospel. If they say yes, they have Christ in them, they are your brother. Period, end of issue. That's it. And that's what Jesus did. He went to the Samaritan leper. Christ is a universal savior. And that means his universal plea should be on our lips and in our actions 24-7. All right, so here's the third thing. You'll see it here in the text. Um, This is probably the most important of all. Um, People argue about this all the time. And, and I think we're going to have some real, real clarity on this. Um, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Amen. He just is. Uh, you know, people argue all the time. I got the text from my dad. He's poking fun at my Jesus. Made me mad. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. Made me mad. He's, Jesus is my best friend. I like to hear that. You know, and he's saying, well, he's, he was a Hebrew good guy and, you know, all these false theories and yeah, whatever, you know. That's what people do. And I asked him about his theory. <laughs> it's like, where's your theory? What's your theory that made you believe that? He got quiet. <laughs> Jesus Christ is God in flesh. Uh, John chapter one says, in the beginning was the word. I don't know what that word is. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Who is this word? Who is this word? Well, verse 14 says, and this word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who, who did that? Jesus. Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ was this word that was with God, and he also was God. And that's why Jesus boldly can say uh, something like this, John 14, 9. Um, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Like, that's, that's, that's scandal. <laughs> that's crazy to, to look at some Jewish folks who, who had worshipped this unseen God. For all these years, and Jesus comes up to him and says, yeah, that God that you've never seen, I'm him. If you've seen me, you've seen him. (gasps) Jesus never claimed to be God, my foot. How about this, John chapter 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. Everyone go, (gasps) There's a little problem for the Jewish folks there. See, the problem is, is this little thing called the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments start out with this. There's only one God, and I'm him, and put no other gods before me. There's only one. And here comes this guy who says, that God and me, we're the same. I'm him. He's me. (laughs) They had this thing at the beginning of every worship service, the Jewish folks. Everyone, everyone. It's called the Shema. You ready for it to get Hebrew up in here? I know Carl's been waiting for this for a long time. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. You guys can't do chad, can you? <laughs> so I remember, I remember, yeah. <laughs> that was for you, Jess. You got it. <clears throat> I remember, I remember, listen, when, I can't read Hebrew, but when I looked it up online, they kind of write it in English letters to sound it right, you know what I mean? 
And I saw it, I was like, Shema Yisrael, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echa. I remember that. I'm 48 years old, but I remember as a kid singing that every time I went to temple. And I never knew what it was. Never. And what it was was, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. That's what it means, right? So this is scandalous. Jewish people are taught through the Ten Commandments and their opening prayer every single time that they meet for worship that there's only one God and Jesus is like, yeah, I'm him. <laughs> Do you know that you're a reflection of God? That's a big, that's an honor, isn't it? When people see you, you're like the moon, you reflect the glory of God. You're not God. God is God, but when they see you, they're supposed to see him. You reflect it, right? And the thing that's unique about Jesus in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus radiates God's own glory. You don't, and I don't. You know, radiate, radiate doesn't reflect. Radiate comes from inside. Inside Jesus is, is God. And that's why it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, for in Christ lives all all the fullness of Christ in a hum- uh, of God in a human body. Let me read it again because so, I messed up. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. There's no, there's no shortage. There's no deficit. He didn't lose any divinity when he came here. He didn't, he's not, he's not uh, less now. Nothing. He is fully God before, then, and now. And, and, and so, you know, the, the Jewish people are freaking out because there's only one God, and, and he's saying that it's him. And they're like, no, 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 there's only one God, there's only one God, there's only one God. And meanwhile, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 6, it says that, yeah, there's only one God, there's only one God, and, and I'm God, and, and I'm telling my angels to worship my son. Why would God, right? Why would God, who's the only one who should receive worship, tell his angels to worship his son if his son was not God? Is God a liar? Would he go back on his word? Would he, would he break his own Ten Commandments? Well, of course not. So if he's telling his angels to worship Jesus, he must be deity, right? Not what you think or what I think or what anyone else thinks. This God, the unseen one, says angels worship Jesus. So it's because he's God. And all these verses declaring with clarity the deity of Jesus Christ, and they mirror our verses here in our text, verses 14 through 18. Let me read it again. He looks at them, the lepers, and he says, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God, praise God, praise God. And he falls at the feet of Jesus Christ, thanking him for what he had done. Praise God. Could he have praised God at home? Could have, right? Could he have praised God at the temple? Could he have praised God along the way? Could he praise God anywhere? Why do you feel it necessary to come back and fall prostrate before Jesus Christ? <laughs> because when he said praise God, he was acknowledging Jesus as God. And that's why it says at the very end of the story, it says here, Jesus says, has no one other than you returned to give glory to God? Well, couldn't, couldn't they give glory to God wherever they were? They could have. But to give glory to God, Jesus, you got to come back there. Jesus was standing there. And so it says he came came back to give glory to God, Jesus Christ. It's kind of cool when someone, you know, something happens, they pray or whatever, and God intervenes, and and they, they say, praise God. Well, that's fine. That's good. But the healed leper, he fell at Jesus' feet. All right, I, I, need, I need a couple of volunteers. Here, you come up here. I need another man. I need another man. And Carl, come up here. Second. Hold on a second. Here, you stand over here. Here, come on, you're over here. Come on, come on, come on. We can't be here all day. Okay, so, so you, let's just pretend that, that you guys are lepers. 
No, no, let's pretend. Let's do, let's do it different. I'll be the leper. I'll be the leper, okay? I'll be the leper, and you guys, I know there's two of you, and there's only one God, but you're both Jesus for just a second. We, okay, so, so if you do something awesome for me, and, and, or, or let's just pretend you're regular people. Let's just, just do that. I, I, I'm working this as I go. You're just regular. You're Carl, and, and you're Tom. You guys can play that better, right? Okay, so if you do something good for me, and I come up to you, and I say, um, um, hey, man, thanks for lunch, man. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Is that cool? All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, right? Right? Okay. So what, what happens if I do this? Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for, for lunch. I, I, I thank you. I couldn't. I, am I making you feel uncomfortable yet? I should. I should, be making you, I should be making you feel very uncomfortable because what I've done is I'm not thanking him. What am I doing? I'm worshiping this man. Right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. So, so, so there's a difference between just thanking someone. You, when you bow, and listen, if you, if you ever go to a church where they're bowing down to anyone except Jesus, you're going to run. But okay, so, so, so I should, you should feel very uncomfortable in that moment. But this guy went to Jesus and bowed down before him. That's worship. That's a definition of worship. Lowering yourself, prostrate before someone greater right? He worshiped. And here's the other thing about Jesus. He's not like the apostles who, when they, when they healed someone, they'd say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. He didn't do that. He claimed personally the healing. I healed, he said. I healed. That's divine. Who, who does the healing? If, 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 I, if I have the spiritual gift of laying my hands to someone and they're healed, right? Did I, so if I lay my hands to you and you're healed, did I heal him? Who, who, God healed him, right? And so Jesus, he didn't say that. Jesus said, I healed him. I healed them. And, you, and, and you're going to tell me I never claimed to be deity. Okay, I healed them. See, it's, it's, it's very, very different. And Jesus is to be worshipped and praised because he is God in flesh. Amen? Okay, all this from the text. Here's the fourth thing. If you, if you have a notebook, you can jot this down. Um, and this is not just, this is not informed like who Jesus is, this part. This is, this is for you. Um, the blessing of Jesus follows obedience. The blessing of Jesus uh, fol follows obedience. How many people just in this room right here uh, show of hands, are waiting for God to do something mighty on their behalf, in their family, their finances, anything like that. Just show your hands. Keep your, and keep your hand up. You're waiting. You've been praying. You want God to do something, right? Awesome. Okay. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your, hand, keep your hands up. Okay. Almost universal. H how many people of those people, their hands up, are, are kind of frustrated with the waiting? Keep your hand up. If you're not, put your hand down. You still frustrated? You're a little frustrated? Yeah. A little frustrated, right? It happens. We get a little frustrated. We've been asking, okay, you can put your hands down. Um, so here, how about this? This might help. The blessing of Jesus follows obedience. <clears throat> Proverbs 28, 9. If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. L Lord, help me with this and, 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 and do this for me and... and, and Lord, why don't you? Here's why. So you've read his word. You've seen what it says. You've heard the, the truth of God's word preached to you right here from this pulpit. And you won't budge. You will not budge. And while you're white knuckling onto this thing that you see in his word that you're supposed to do, and I won't let go, but I want you, Jesus, to move mightily over here. And Jesus says, talk to the hand. He's not going to listen. Because your prayer, listen, loved ones, is detestable to him. Detestable. Not, not just like, well, I'm not going to do it. It's, it, it's, it turns the stomach of the Almighty, if you will. You, you're pray, like, he's like, well, wait, wait, you want me to do but you won't listen to me. You, you, you won't listen to me. I've told you about this, and you won't do it, but yet you want me to. <clears throat> See, if that's you, 
Here's your word from the Lord. Blessing follows obedience. You see it here in the text. The lepers stand at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So there's something that they want, right? Desperately. It says they were crying out. Have you ever cried out in prayer? For your hands, when your hand was up a little bit ago and you said you're waiting on God to do something, did you ever just cry out to him? Like, 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 just cry, like yelling at the top, please, Lord, do something for me, right? Well, that's what these people are doing. Crying out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And what does he say? He looks at them and he says, go show yourselves to the priest. I found that kind of strange that Jesus would do that. You know, when you, when, you, when you read the Bible and you see something you don't want to do, or, or I get up here and I tell you what it says, and this is what you ought to do, and you don't want to do it, and just think about these lepers for a second. Remember what I told you a little bit ago about lepers in that culture? They're complete social outcasts, and they're religious outcasts. And so what Jesus does, so, so they come to this guy who's not like a religious, Jesus is not a religious guy, but they come to him in hopes that he's not, that he's just going to be kind and help them. And what is his response? His response to these people who are crying out to him for help is, I want you to go and present yourself to the ones who, 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 who represent the Jewish faith that says you're not allowed in here. I want you to go to the ones who are going to slam the door in your face and say, get out of here. You're not allowed in here. I want you to go to them. Does that make any sense? You think that's the answer they wanted to hear? Kind of like the answer you get when you open the Bible. That's not what I wanted to hear, God. And that's not what they wanted to hear. They represent the epitome of the religious that don't like them that don't want anything to do with them. And and you want me to go to them? You want me to do what, God? Yeah, I want you to do that. So what happens in verse 14? Go show yourselves to the priest. I don't want to do it. But as they went, as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. As they were obedient. Could we just put that in there? As they were, as, as they gave up their will to the Father and said, yes, I will, even though I don't want to. Remember Jesus? He knew he was going to have pain, and he said, I'm going to do it anyway. I know this is going to hurt. I know they're going to mock me. I know they're going to spit on me. I know I'm going to die. I know my Father's going to look away from me. I know within me I will, I will house the punishment for all sin of all men for all time. Can you imagine the pain? I can't. And he knew he was going to do it, but he did it anyway. He was obedient. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Because he knew if he was obedient, good would come of it. And you have to know that. You need to stop holding on to stuff that you won't let go of and let God bless your life. And, and we're trying to hold on to stuff and ask him, no, he won't do it. He won't do that. See, we have it backwards. <laughs> because in our little uh, enlightenment world where we think we're the center of the universe, our philosophy is, Lord, if you do this, I'll do this. He's the rock won't move and his word is strong, right? You're not. And I'm not. And you can't circumvent the system. He made a system. You want to be blessed? This is what you do. And there's no way of getting around that. He's the sovereign one. And so we have it all wrong. Blessing follows obedience. And if you're waiting for God to do something crazy in your life, maybe the problem isn't that problem. Maybe the problem is another problem that you won't budge on. Because you're praying, help this. And God's like, I will as soon as you do this. Maybe that's the problem. Some of you need to hear that. 
So if blessing follows obedience, here's the fifth and final thing. Blessing follows obedience, but salvation follows worship. Kind of weird. <clears throat> it says that they obeyed, right? This, they obeyed and they got healed. One only, only one came back to give credit where credit was due, but, but all of them went and they got healed. They obeyed as they, and as they went, they got healed. But if you look at the text and you want to reread it a hundred times, you can do that. Nowhere in here, up to verse 14, when this happens, nowhere in it does it mention that this leper became a Christian. Not at all. It never says that. And you might think, well, he got healed and, you know, he's going to become a Christian. Well, not necessarily. Maybe you might think, well, he's only going to get healed because only Christians can talk to God and, and he'll respond. I mean, we have a thing. We can, we can go into the throne room and on the authority of Jesus and the other people that are not, they, they can't do that. That's true, but that doesn't matter. Romans 9, 15 says that God says, I will show mercy to anyone I choose. So, so after he gets healed, he's obedient, he goes to the priest, and as he's walking to the, to the priest, he's healed, but then after that, it says that he worshiped. He praised God, he fell at Jesus' feet, he thanked Jesus, and he gave glory to God. And see, this acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ is, it resulted in this word sozo. This is a, a Greek word, it says, um, Jesus said, now, um, let me read it to you. He says, um, now stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. And some, some versions won't say healed you. It says made you whole or well. Um, that's awesome, okay? That's great. Your faith has made you sozo is the word there. And, and, and it's, in the Greek, it does mean healed, but he was already healed. He'd already been healed, right? He'd already been healed, and he was giving glory to God for it. But now Jesus uses a different word. He says he's made you sozo. So no, 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 no. It's not healed. It's not made whole. One of the, the last definition for the word sozo is saved. The acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ was didn't get him healed physically. The acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ was as God saved him. Salvation followed the worship. Amen? So now the band is going to come up, and we're going to sing. We're going to worship because it, because it says, we just learned, that Jesus Christ should be worshipped, right? Amen. He should be worshipped. And so we're going to worship him right now. You've been informed as to who Jesus is, and you've been informed as to who you should be. And so now the process of conformation continues. And, and we're to praise Jesus Christ. So the main things I want you to take with you here, because you want to be informed so you can be conformed. Listen, Jesus Christ is super intentional with everything he does. He is focused, he is determined, he is unchanging in his mission, and so should you. Jesus Christ is a universal savior. That means he makes salvation available to all people and as his Christ followers, then we need to make salvation available to all people, not just the ones that look like us, act like us, or the ones that we like. And Jesus Christ is God in flesh. He is to be worshipped and praised. God the Father, the unseen one, told his angels to worship Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is to be obeyed. If we want to receive blessing in our life, it comes through the funnel of obedience. And Jesus saves. His ear is not too deaf to hear your cry. And his arm is so long that he can reach any person that cries out to him, even you. Even you. Well, why, don't we, why don't we pray to this Jesus? Let's talk to him, and then we'll sing to him. Have you been informed? Okay. Are you willing to be conformed? Okay, awesome. Well, Father, you heard the voices of your people. They are they have uh, no shortage of information now. You've been faithful to provide that. 
And so now, Lord, it's up to us. We want to be conformed. We are willing to be conformed into what we just heard. Lord, help us to stop white-knuckling things. Help us to let go of the things we think we don't want to do because pain is on the horizon. Because fear cripples us. Because culture tells us not to let go. That we deserve something. Honestly, Lord, we deserve death and hell. But by the grace of God, we've been given your spirit. We've been given a chance to receive it. Awesome. Lord, help us with our unbelief. Help us with our rebellion. Help us with our stubbornness. Help us to be healed as we go. Help us to go. Help us to go. So help us to go, Lord. You are waiting to bless. You're waiting to move. Waiting for us to let go. God, over the storm, we praise you. We praise you. And we lift up the name of Jesus Christ as Lord. Let's come to our feet and let's sing to the Lord. Let's sing to the Lord. Let the last thing we do before we go home to hunker down before this storm is to praise him and tell him he is wonderful and beautiful and he is high and lifted up and he is above this storm. You are king, Lord. You are king. And no one else is king except you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.